For as much as Vladimir Putin and his chief diplomat Sergei Lavrov have criticized a unipolar world and American dominance, there exists an unspoken sphere of influence. After all, the USA has long been setting agendas in the Western world, in parts of the Middle East, parts of Latin America and in parts of Asia. In the post-Soviet world, however, the tone has largely been set by Moscow. If we look at the map of the former Soviet Union, certainly the Baltic nations broke away immediately and conclusively, but Belarus is completely under Russia's control, as is Armenia due to its difficult geopolitical situation. And though Azerbaijan has for years been swinging between Ankara and Moscow, it was always flexible to the needs of Putin. Moldova was changing its course from Putin's embrace to the West and back, with most of the population, if not half, in support of the socialists, a reflection of the Kremlin's deep and powerful political influence. In Georgia, things are much more complex as the population there has categorically rejected the occupation of its own regions by Russian troops, although a completely dependent political class there provides Moscow room to move. And in Kazakhstan, it was unimaginable that Astana would ever step out of line. On behalf of Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and others, the main political request has always been for a strong partner and Russia was naturally fitting this description. Emumali Rahmon has led Tajikistan since 1992 and in that time has never once criticized Putin's dictatorship. Which is precisely why nobody would have ever imagined that Rahmon, the eternal Putin supporter, would risk a public demonstration of discontent, irritation and resentment. After all, there he was in 2021, the only foreign guest at Russia's May 9th military parade, saying all the right things to save Putin's face against Russia's growing isolation. He spoke at a summit last week in Astana in a break from his usual practice, but instead expressed his personal thoughts. What's important to stress here is that he did not break ties with Moscow because Dushanbe is in no way ready for that. Rather, he demanded more money and better conditions because he was bargaining, showing Putin that in this new current conditions, Tajikistan has a choice. No, нас нет 100 миллионов, нет 200 миллионов, но у нас есть история, культура, мы любим, мы хотим, чтобы нас уважали. As for the Central Asian republics, all of them were under Russia's thumb right up until the invasion of Ukraine. The constant economic difficulties of Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan all helped to create a strong dependence on Moscow. Their citizens came en masse to earn money and in 2019 alone, before the pandemic, as many as 4 million labor migrants were sending remittances back home from Russia. These earnings might have amounted to mere kopecks, but for their families this was enough to live on. And in Moscow, Petersburg and other big cities, these Asian guest workers weren't even considered as human beings. Their rights were violated in a brutal way. The migrants lived and worked in conditions of slavery, but their own governments could come up with no other viable solutions because there was no work at home to offer. For everyone, this humiliating situation was the least worst option. What is this? Сплю. Утром, как поставить смена, 8 или 9, до утра ночи. Эту комнату мы сами сняли. Они сейчас в данное время на работу, и кто-то свои дела личным. Since the beginning of mobilization, governments, which previously were considered as Russia's backyard, have opened their borders to those Russian men who are fleeing the war. Unafraid of Putin's rage, these countries took an independent position that dared to disagree with Moscow. The choice to provide shelter to those for whom the locals might express a clear dislike is perhaps the greatest demonstration of foresight by both Kazakhstan's Tokayev and Kyrgyzstan's Zhaparov. Without making loud declarations against Putin's aggression in Ukraine, which is a level of freedom they don't yet possess, these leaders nevertheless are acting in line with European values, in line with the values of humanism. We do not Taiwan. Ни Косово, ни 
Южной Абхазии, не Южной Осетии, не Абхазию. И, по всей видимости, этот принцип будет применен и в отношении квазигосударственных территорий, коими, на наш взгляд, является Луганск и Донецк. Right now, it is literally all they can do, but doing it this way is a big start. In fact, the unity created in the ruins of the USSR that existed for years has only proven its ineffectiveness and inability at solving anything. This is particularly true in the case of war. It is enough to say about the Commonwealth of Independent States that among their chief priorities was, quote, to guarantee human rights and freedom, as well as cooperation for international peace and security. What is to become of the region after the conflict, if in fact the fighting does not lead to the self-destruction and the global war? In Washington, they are undoubtedly asking the same question, and quite naturally, it is not in Washington's interest to see Beijing rise up where the Kremlin has fallen down. But one main question hangs above all others. What will happen in Russia after Putin? The influential Washington Post is calling on the West to get ready. Of course, it would be tremendous to see Alexei Navalny in Russia's seat of power, fully prepared to institute democratic reforms, return citizens their rights and re-establish relations with progressive nations. But how much of that is likely to happen? What is to be done with a society that has hardened over the last 20 years, fooled into agreeing with the Kremlin's line that America is deceptively planning to seize Holy Rus? How can relations with Russia be rebuilt after Putin? Especially in light of the fact that the electorate may yet again choose to seat an unsympathetic authoritarian populist on the Kremlin throne, in light of the fact that he will not only return to repressions inside the country, but to the resurrection of control over former countries of the USSR. The Washington Post has no answers to these questions, but there is a recommendation. The West must remain open for Russians. And I would add to this myself, inform and show the world, don't slam the door in anyone's face, but rather do the opposite and invite them in so that they may come to desire freedom for themselves and the neighboring countries of the post-Soviet space, so that they may no longer desire the resurrection of the empire.